After storming to the edge of a cliff this week, early indications suggest that the U.S. and Iran apparently have decided they do not want to jump, at least not yet. Let's seek an in-depth analysis of the situation and try to read between the lines of President Trump's speech just hours ago. Joining me live from Washington, D.C. is Rhonda Slim, senior fellow at the Washington-based Middle East Institute. Rhonda, welcome to the program. Good to be with you. Now, the big question after Iran's missile attack on the Iraqi bases housing U.S. troops was whether Mr. Trump would view the Iranian response to U.S. taking out of Soleimani as a reason to escalate the situation or to look for an exit ramp. Now, it appears he chose the latter. What are you reading into President Trump's statement on Iran? I mean, what are some of the most noteworthy takeaways? Look, I think the red line that Mr. Trump has articulated to warrant U.S. action to any real retaliation uh, by the Iranian is if there are uh, U.S. human casualties. And the fact that the Iranian attacks did not result in U.S. human casualties, that means that Mr. Trump was not going to escalate. And as you well, as you pointed out, he chose to send a message of firmness, of confidence, banking the win that he has achieved by killing Mr. Soleimani, but at the same time extending a hand uh, to Iran for restarting negotiations uh, about the nuclear file, but also about other issues. But more importantly, restarting negotiation within the P5 plus one framework, which Mr. Trump has been opposed to until now. He has always favored bilateral negotiations between the U.S. and Iran. That was difficult for Iranian officials to accept. But now he seems to have changed his tune and saying that there's a possibility that these negotiations could be relaunched following the P5 plus one framework, something which would be more acceptable to the Iranians and which with some creative diplomacy by Europeans, Chinese, Russian, could maybe lead to the restart of a diplomatic track, hopefully building on this de-escalation phase. And I have to emphasize, it's a phase, it's one round. And it doesn't mean that this is the whole story yet. Definitely, that was a um, it was a surprising move uh, by Mr. Trump going on the multinational uh, route. Now, uh, for the for all the public chest thumping in the last week, both sides appear to be taking measures to de-escalate. But what can we expect from the Iranian side from now on? I mean, could we expect Iran to continue attacks or not? I mean, we cannot confirm at this point whether there is any correlation, but we are getting reports that two rockets just crashed into the Iraqi capital screen zone, the high security enclave where foreign embassies, including the U.S. mission, are based. What are you reading into that? Well, uh, interestingly, there was a statement just put out by one of the spokespersons of the PMF, the Popular Mobilization Forces, which is a network of militias that is supposedly integrated into the state, mm -hmm. but really many of them do not answer to the state. These are very much close to Iran, funded by Iran. So they just put out a statement saying these two rockets, which you just referred to, they have nothing to do with them. It's not them. Although previous mortar attacks on the green zone in other parts around Baghdad have always been, you know, attributed to them. So the fact that they had they put out the statement is interesting. Uh, there is now some jockeying again among these Iraqi paramilitary forces uh, for power now that one of their leaders, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, who was the brain behind the operation in Iraq, was killed along, along with General Qasem Soleimani. So going forward, what we are going to see more like from Iran is to revert to its old ways. Iran in the past, when it attacked, you know, uh, other interests uh, like happened in Saudi Aramco last summer, it used proxies or it used ways which gives it room for deniability. I think this time, the last yesterday's attack, they needed to own it for their own domestic purposes. They need to say, we attack the U.S., we send these in retaliation for the murder of General Qasem Soleimani. Going forward, as I said, 
said, you know, Mr. I mean, the Supreme Leader already tweeted, his office tweeted saying that what happened yesterday was only a slap. And this is not, doesn't mean the end of the military activities. So I think going forward, what we're going to see is more like Iran revert, reverting to its typical modus operandi of attacking maybe U.S. installation, maybe U.S. assets in the region or abroad, but using proxies in order to create some room, room for deniability between it and the attack. Right, and giving room for perhaps more talks or negotiations with the U.S. and perhaps European and Europe. Am I correct? Correct, correct, correct. I think because, I mean, the idea is to fight and talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, what is Iraq's stance in all this? I mean, the U.S. drone killing of Iranian General Soleimani was carried out on Iraqi territory. Iran's missile attacks targeted Iraqi bases housing U.S. troops. We know Iraq had been voting for withdrawal of U.S. troops from its land. Yes, I think Iraq is really in a tough place, and it is in a place it never wanted to be, which is right there stuck in the middle of a U.S.-Iranian military confrontation. It's something that all the presidencies in Iraq, the president, speaker of the parliament, prime minister, have always been saying, we don't want to be stuck in the middle. And yet they are stuck in the middle. And the fact that not only General Soleimani was killed, but also Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, who is an important leader of these paramilitary forces, was also killed. There has has been until recently, until yesterday, a rush or a momentum to, uh, you know, to expel U.S. forces out of Iraq. But the fact that yesterday's attack, which was also a breach of Iraqi territorial sovereignty, was carried out by Iran, is going to make it very difficult for the Iraqi prime minister now to claim that he wanted to expel U.S. forces because they breached territorial sovereignty, whereas now, uh, w without calling on Iran, you know, to, to do the same or without call or without calling for harsh measure against the UN or without taking you know for, uh, for uh, lodging a formal complaint against Iran at the at the Security Council in the United Nations which I think politically is not going to be feasible for him he condemned the attack yesterday's mm -hmm. attack but he is not going to be able to take it further but that's going to limit his ability to really move on with this call to expel US forces from Iraq it doesn't mean that the American president as he said today, he does not want to get the forces out at some point. And so the question is how this is going to be navigated diplomatically going forward. All right. Uh, Rhonda Slim, a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. Many thanks for your valuable insights today. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Thank you very much.